Hi and welcome to our program. Today we are checking out the art exhibition The North Sea Lake by Sarah Caputo and Brenda Unwin. So follow us for a talk with the artists and a guided tour uh, here at Godspaden. Follow me. And thank you so much for having Hi. us, Sarah Hi. and Brenda. Uh, so what is this um, exhibition about, this, uh, the North Sea Lake about? Well, it's about, uh, basically it's about immigration. It's about uh, the idea that immigration isn't a new thing. Immigration has been going on for millions of thousands of millions of years, yes. And, um, but it's become very topical in the news recently. And it's as though it's a new thing and it's as though it's a completely negative thing. And we wanted to look more into the positive aspects of immigration. So we began by looking um, at Norfolk as a whole and um, how Norfolk had benefited from immigration from over the years from the Bronze Age, Iron Age, Stone Age, right through to uh, contemporary times. And um, we found that the Vikings were a vital part of that integration and um, then we met someone called Brian Ayres who had been studying this and he he had this concept that the um, <coughs> the North Sea was more of a lake not like a highway for trading and sharing of ideas and that's what gave us the idea of calling our exhibition the North Sea Lake and um, looking at the the relationship between England and Denmark as particularly East Anglia and Denmark. Would you like to add something? Um, well, Brian Ayres is a senior uh, lecturer at the university and he was incredibly helpful about uh, the whole concept of tra travel and exchange between Denmark particularly and East Anglia. And so we explored, as Sarah was saying, all sorts of influences into East Anglia and the fact that when you turn the map upside down or sideways on you can really see it is a lake, could be a lake and was connected by Doggerland till 12,000 years ago um, when the sea levels rose after the Ice Age it disappeared but before that you could actually walk from one landmass to another from East Anglia to Denmark and to Europe so yeah. And uh, um, what about the inspiration, like what made you um, focus on this topic and how long have you met this researcher? Shall I start? Mm -hmm. Well, in 2015 we uh, were uh, selected to do a project on East Anglia, about 2,000 years of immigration into East Anglia, looking at uh, Romans onwards. <coughs> Saxons, Vikings and so on. So that sparked our interest in really looking at it historically and then looking at the artefacts in the various museums in East Anglia. And then we had a research grant to come to Denmark and went to several museums here, 
Yelling, Bebo, Copenhagen, um, Moise Gard, and Mech senior curators who very kindly showed us their artifacts and that sparked off an interest in what we would draw and what we would use in the, in the fabrics. Would you like to add something? Well, previously to that, we both worked together. In fact, Brenda wrote um, a degree course for um, arts and well-being. So it was very much about social interaction and social um, engagement projects. So we've always had that um, background. Of, I've worked very much with vulnerable people, um, introducing art and as a, as a, not exactly as a therapy, but a way of finding themselves. And um, Brenda, obviously, has uh, has taught, and I taught too on this on the arts and well 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 being degree, um, and so we we always felt that our work needed to have a social aspect to it, and and try to integrate people more than separate them out. So this fell in very nicely with our our kind of background, didn't it? This idea of looking at the positive aspects of immigration. So that's your main message with uh, this work and your pre previous works? Exactly, yes. And one of the reasons we chose God's Barn as a place to show our work, well, we chose to apply to show it here, was because it has a very large range of people coming in and out. So we can reach a wider audience, not just people who might go to a gallery, but all sorts of people. And, um, and it's a cultural centre, and it's for everybody. And that's what we liked about it. And the staff here couldn't have been more helpful. Really, very, very good. And we, you know, we obviously had to communicate by email and Zoom and all the rest of it before because of the pandemic. But we've been uh, very supported by them and the technical staff too. Perfect. And uh, uh, your previous projects, you have a project that is the 1,000 uh, handshakes. Yeah. It also kind of has the same message, right? Indeed. Yes. It that was one that we did earlier. Again, it was with a community festival. We were selected, only one of 10 groups in the country, to try and make something of the community and also the idea that something that's so ephemeral as a handshake could be made tangible by making it in clay and firing it. And it represented a greeting or sealing a deal or saying goodbye. And in the course of that, we were in the Leeds bus station, just rushing up to people and saying, would you mind shaking hands with a stranger? And amazingly, most people were really, really helped. This was pre-pandemic, pre-COVID. We're really keen to do that from little children to old age pensioners and so on. You even got a dog, at, I think, at That's one right, point. Yes. <laughs> but we even got a dog. stories as well. I mean, people, you know, really wanted to tell you why they were in Leeds, what they were doing and so on. So it was, it's, it was a very good experience from that. And the, the uh, festival managers liked the results so much that they gave us an exhibition in Leeds the following year, just of this work, which was in the centre of Leeds and beautifully displayed by them. So, yeah, that was very successful. And also, each time someone did a handshake, we got them to write on a postcard, a joint postcard each time, a pair of people did a handshake, got them to write on a postcard and say where they were coming from and where they were going to that day. And that inspired conversations between those two people. And quite often they kind of swapped emails or something or went off talking together. And then we numbered each handshake. So when we had the exhibition, they could come back and together find their handshake and shake hands with their handshake again. And some people managed to do that, didn't they? And we said that they could take their handshake away if they wanted to and share it between them, you know. But they wanted to leave them so that they were part of a, the set, as though, the, you know, they were, they were keeping on with that idea of people being together rather than separate. And where does this uh, interest for uh, social inclusion and cultural, uh, cultural exchange come from? I think it started off with the degree course because I was very keen on if you're going to have people working in the community rather than them being kind of low-level projects to be trained as proper art artists and to know about art so that they could take something of value into the community. Um, and because they all went on placements and we encouraged that and we set them up and so on, the whole idea of the cultural exchange in the community took hold then. 
I mean, we would do work independently, so I'm a ceramicist, sculptor, I'm a painter, um, but we do this as a joint activity, um, kind of as a uh, offsetting other things, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so initially um, we were working together and we were, because it was an art course, we were marking art, the, the students' artwork together and having these amazing conversations about their placements and their artwork and we discovered that we had sort of a joint interest in, in several different aspects of art and social engagement. And when we stopped working on that course, we missed those conversations so much that we decided we'd meet up once a month and just go somewhere and see what happened, really. Not with a plan to work collaboratively, just to have those conversations. But as, we, as those conversations evolved, we discovered that um, we had so much in common. And when this opportunity came up to do a project for um, Norfolk 2000, we were just we just thought well, we have to do this together mm. and it's evolved from them and we had this sort of basis that we were working on where it had to be fun and it had to be enjoyable and not too stressful because being an individual artist can be quite stressful and anxiety making but i don't know about you brenda but i find that working together you feel much more relaxed about what you're doing and things like coming here to denmark and putting a show up is much less stressful if it's shared with somebody else and it's like an adventure yeah um, yeah <laughs> yes absolutely because working in your studio on your own can be quite lonely week after week <laughs> so it's very nice to have a contrast and to share ideas mm -hmm. and to take risks or try out things that you wouldn't normally do in your own practice so although i have a knowledge of printmaking i'm not necessarily a screen printer per se um, and likewise, oh. you know, there are other aspects for you, aren't there? Neither of us are like group people, really, are we, uh, in, in the way we work. We are very individual in our own art practice. And to collaborate is quite an unusual thing. For, well, very unusual. I've never done it before, and neither has Brenda, as far as I know. I think it works because we're friends. Mm. Yes. As well as colleagues, and mm. we have known each other for mm. 20 years, nearly. Mm. And so we've built up an understanding, a bit like an old married couple, really. You know, so yes. <laughs> honesty between us, haven't we? Yes, which is really important. Yes, yeah. But you continue to to write on uh, to work on your own projects. Meanwhile, yes, yes, I'm preparing for a big show next summer of my paintings. Um, yeah, so we, yeah, I'm working independently. But sometimes things from this will spark off ideas that can be taken into that work. And yes, yeah. and I've. I'm, I haven't got any exhibitions coming up, but I have work in galleries and uh, during Brexit I was in an exhibition in Germany and um, more to do with my ceramics and my sculpture. But um, it's interesting how working on this feeds into our own work, whether it's colour or, or form or the, the concept, you can't help but find that it's creeping into your own work in a good way, in a really beneficial way. Yes, yeah, so it, it really opens your mind and helps you to think much more laterally about, about things. It is an adventure, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is, yes. And what about the materials that you work with? Um, well, in this work, um, the drawing I did over there is basically inks and bleach. And there are some downstairs which are using that, and oil pastels paint. Um, I usually work in oil paint on canvas, you know, if I'm doing work for an exhibition, but also have a strong drawing interest. This work um, is shared between us. We've done sh separate sheets and the screen prints we work together um, on the fabric downstairs. Is that? Um, uh, and you were doing the ceramics part? 
Yes, yes. But the thing is about that is that things I've discovered from, well, first of all, because we were teaching on this arts and wellbeing degree, we both have an understanding of a lot of different um, processes. processes and materials. So we could bring in the things like the printing. And, and because we have this wealth of ideas, we can introduce different aspects into our own work. So for instance, I do a lot of printing and a lot of layering on my, on my ceramics. I'm not, I'm not um, trained in ceramics. It's something I've learned by myself, which is really good for me, I think, because I haven't got any restrictions, any idea of rules or anything like that. And um, the same with our screen printing. We just... Work we work we? very intuitively, yes. And we worked for a while at a, at a screen printing um, place in Norwich where you could do large, large pieces. And they were fascinated by the methods we used because we were so... Um, uh, relaxed in our use of screen printing, which is actually normally a very quite tight, process-driven um, way of working. Yeah. yeah, we were coming at it from a fine art point of view rather than a technical screen printing point of view, which usually, you know, you think of posters, you think of repeat designs on fabric, um, the traditional way of using screen printing. We decided to work more intuitively and place the imagery where it felt correct on the fabric or the piece of paper. Mm. And how does it work for you to work together? Like, how do you do the pieces together? Do you brainstorm before? Do you share your tasks? How does it work? I think we do a lot of talking beforehand, thinking about ideas, uh, eliminating ideas, what's not going to work very well, what, what we can actually do independently and what we can do together. So, for instance, with the screen prints, like, um, sorry, the, the ones downstairs, there are, uh, we both drew um, collected imagery, photographed imagery. Then we would uh, select the colors, um, place them, and thinking, you know, having a, quite a key in terms of what sort of colors we wanted to use with which fabric. And with the screen printing, if you can imagine three or four meters laid out on a table, we would go along each with a screen in our hands and say, oh, I'll put that one there, oh, I'll put that one there. And so it, I'd put that one there, <laughs> yes. And so it would evolve as, as it went on. It wasn't a set plan beforehand. It was the set bit was knowing which images we were going to use and which range of colours we were going to use on each piece. But apart from that, it was all experimental. What about you? Um, well, uh, the interesting thing I felt when we were doing the screen printing was it became a bit like a dance, didn't it? Um, because of the, the walking up and down the, the, the fabric and the rhythm of doing the screen printing. And, and it was like dancing together in a way, wasn't it? So it, it, it had a very kind of... Um, uh, difficult to explain the word, but it had a, a kind of a so contact. Yeah, it, uh, so it did, yes, that's, that's it. Mm. But we also made the tissue paper boats, which you'll see downstairs. Um, I think we made 500 or so of those uh, independently. You know, Sarah would be working in her studio, I'd be working in mine, and then we'd we'd uh, see what each had made and how many we'd made and how many more we had to do. It became really interesting, didn't it? Because of because of Brexit, uh, not Brexit, sorry, COVID this time. Um, because of COVID, we couldn't actually meet up and see what each other was making, and and we'd made our own moulds for the boats. And, um, uh, but we, we talked about the size of them and everything, and we thought we were doing exactly the same thing. We'd done tests, yes. And yet, interestingly, we can tell exactly who made which boat. And uh, that adds to their, I think, that adds to their interest that we've got this difference between them. They've got the same materials, exactly the same method, but they've come out differently. In a, but in a really positive way, haven't they? And that was really interesting because we were, we were just working through photographs and talking rather than seeing the actual yeah. things. And I think we've sort of circled around the idea of immigration, roots of arti artifacts from crisscrossing over the North Sea and come at it from various different ways together and independently. But the core has been the fact that things have crossed over the North Sea for a long, long time, and all cultures have benefited, you know, the, the English culture and the Danish culture. And that's what we're really kind of keen on as a very positive 
um, aspect, if you like, of not only life now, but life in the past. It's always been so. Mm. Mm -hmm. And although we've concentrated on East Anglia and Denmark, it actually can be viewed on a more global level in that, you know, wherever there's sharing of ideas and things, usually people benefit much more than they, than, um, than the negative aspects, if there are any of it. <laughs> yes. That's it. Uh, do you feel like um, there are some type of barriers, right, like right now, like what type of things are contributing to this social, historical, economic barriers that we feel nowadays between East Anglia and uh, Denmark or Europe in general? Well, obviously Brexit hasn't helped. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not so sure about barriers between Europe and Britain at the moment, other than political. Um, I think on a personal level, we seem to have quite a lot in common with Denmark. Obviously, we've had shared history and shared kings and so on in the kings and queens in the past. But I think, um, no, I think there's... With Europe, we're, there's still quite a lot of... I think the problem with Britain is is it is an island and it is going to be more and more isolated, really. So we want to do everything we can to sh not let that happen with us, personally, and our, or our outlook on things. And it's interesting now, because on the media in England, people from Europe aren't spoken about as fellow Europeans, they're spoken about as foreigners. And it's very much that sort of divide and rule aspect that seems to be going on rather than trying to join together and, and benefit from our, our, our similarities. And about the exhibition, what has been the feedback so far? We have a very positive feedback um, from uh, quite a lot of Danish people and um, Europeans as well, I mean, English people mm -hmm. who've come in. And people have really related to the idea of this link between uh, Scandinavia and England. Um, they've liked the work, they've liked seeing the artifacts, haven't they? And they've really liked the way the whole thing's used the space of God's Barn rather than having to fight it, you know, because it's such a big space to, to deal with. And we didn't really know how we were going to deal with it till we arrived on the Monday morning to put it up. <laughs> And that evolved too, didn't it? Between us, that was us working together again. Um, but what's been also interesting is the stories that people have brought to us about their links between Denmark and oh, England yes. Yes. and um, how they really appreciate us looking at this aspect of it rather than the negatives. Mm. Mm. Are there any um, other projects that you're currently working on or are you planning to take this exhibition back to England and show it there? What's the plan? Yes, we are planning on taking it back and showing it. We're looking at uh, several venues. Some are on the coast because in the north of uh, Norfolk, we've got the uh, Kings Lynn with the Hanseatic League, which was with Germany and uh, Scandinavia. Uh, we're looking at places like Ipswich and Norwich. We want um, a good venue of a good size, so we'll we're, we're see which we select, really. And hopefully similar type of venue to this, where it's not actually a gallery, it's, it's a venue that um, also increases people's um, growing relationships with each other. So tell us more about this uh, art. Well, this, this is a drawing on very thick paper because it's built up technically with layers of ink, uh, red inks and black inks, and then worked through drawn with bleach and sticks, ordinary household bleach. But the idea of the drawing is showing the amazing travels that the Vikings did, you know, from little Denmark here compared to all this, or going up through to America, Iceland, Greenland, up to the Arctic Circle. So you can perhaps see this is supposed to be the Mediterranean. Here we've got Italy with the mm -hmm. boot and the shoe and going f to the Far East. So they, they um, the Middle East, they, they, they went by sea, obviously, but they also went through major rivers like the Rhine and so on, down through the Black Sea and beyond towards Afghanistan. So it's just a, an idea, imaginative idea. I'm not saying they actually travelled that particular route, yeah. but they did something very like that and going up mm -hmm. through the Baltic. So it's kind of just trying to place what, how amazing these Vikings 
were, you know. And when I was amazed when I read that the sails on these long ships were made of wool, woven. Mm -hmm. You know, and you think, well, how insane is that? They'd get waterlogged and heavy, but they must have yeah. proofed them in some way, so they lasted. Mm -hmm. So they were, you know, in England we're um, given this idea of the Vikings as nasty people who came and, you know, raided yeah. Lindisfarne and mm -hmm. so on and caused havoc. But actually they brought so much more and were very cultured, very civilised people, I think. For, for that you can see through the artifacts and, and how they settled in the country, uh, in England, and also, you know, integrated, married, so they became part of the community rather than always on the outside. And that was it for today. Uh, thank you for staying with us and we hope you enjoyed this time with the artists Sarah Caputo and Brenda Unwin as much as we did. See you next time. <laughs>